know and love rather than many faces. I find big uh, congregation very threatening. I remember speaking in one congregation where there was almost 300, and I found that very difficult. And I didn't know, I think, any of them. And, and that was tough. But this, I'm with friends. And this is, this is where I want to be. I want to speak to um, congregations like this. Not numbers, but those that I know love the Lord. And in spite of knowing how frail I am, love me in the Lord. So we're going to speak on the relevance of the Protestant Reformation and what it means to be reformed. Now we read in 2 Chronicles 29, we're not going to do an exposition of that passage. We chose that as a, a good example of the principle of Reformation in Scripture. It's the Lord calling, it's the Lord choosing, and the men of God responding to God's direct commands and doing his will. But to ask the question in this two part uh, paper really is because there's two issues here. There's the relevance of the Reformation <coughs> and what it means to be reformed are two uh, distinct, although uh, they do go together. Can something that happened 500 years ago be relevant today? How relevant is the Protestant? Reformation. Let us consider these two questions uh, this afternoon. But I would suggest to you, in order to understand how relevant the Reformation is, it's helpful to consider what those outside of Reformed circles would say regarding it. Those within a circle can falsely imagine uh, that everything that matters only exists within our circle. In other words, we are the world and we know what matters. But what does the outside world think regarding and have to say regarding the relevance of the Protestant Reformation? Well, let me quote to you from an article written for CNN, which are no great fans of uh, the Reformation or Reformed theology or any form of Christianity indeed. Uh, one of their uh, reporters or writers has written this, the Reformation was one of the decisive events that made the world we live in. That's from CNN. The Reformation was one of the decisive events that made the world we live in. He goes on to speak of three gifts that the Reformation gave us. Number one, free inquiry. No human authority has the right to bind our conscience. Secondly, democracy. And of course, Calvin and Knox, much more than Luther, worked out uh, the idea that no man is born with the right to rule. That all right to rule is temporary and is given by God and there is only one sovereign and according to Calvin all men are equal because there's only two classes there is mankind and there's God there is no steps of hierarchy between God and man all mankind are subject to the sovereign rule of God it's interesting um, that uh, Reformation theology and Calvinism indeed gives a greater liberty to man than other forms of thought. Because it's liberating to know that only God is sovereign. That we are not sovereign and God is and therefore nobody has the right by natural birth or being born of a, in a certain family to rule over your conscience. Thirdly, limited government. The principle, this writer says, that a government's first duty is to get out of its way. I, I love this. The principle that the government's first duty is to get out of the way of its people's lives as much as it can. It's a principle they wove into the DNA of the United States. That principle is dying, isn't it? The government, and we've seen it, no matter what view you take of the last couple of years, 
Governments are taking too much control into their hands, and we are giving it to them. Why? Because we've lost Reformation principles. We're going back into the bondage of the idea that man has a right to rule over man. And people in certain offices and certain buildings have a right to tell you exactly what you should think, what you should do, and how you should live. See, this is happening because we are losing the Reformation. We are losing the principles of the Protestant Reformation. In an article written for the Arizona State University in 2017, the question is asked, why is the Protestant Reformation important to talk about 500 years later? Answer, in a sense, the history of the individual in the West begins with the Protestant Reformation. How true that is. We have about a thousand years of darkness prior to the Protestant Reformation. In a nutshell, the writer says, the Reformation moved the focus of religious authority from the church, the institution, to the Bible, the place of real authority. And again, if I can say as part of a, a side thought on that, it's not a side thought, uh, not a side thought at all, really. We see the proliferation of translations, this watering down of the scriptures, this attack on the text, again, as part of the, the enemy's desire to destroy all the Reformation devils. Removing all the pillars, all the foundations, and all the blessings that gave us what we have, or at least had, uh, in recent history. In a paper written for Chapman University, California, in 2016, we read this. The Protestant Reformation is one of the defining events of the last millennium. Nearly 500 years after the Reformation, its causes and consequences have seen a renewed interest in the social sciences. Research in economics and sociology and so on, I won't finish the quote, but the point is, it all flows out of the Reformation. Now these are writers that have uh, no sympathy with our convictions, who have no agreement with us, but they recognize that the Protestant Reformation is central to all the things that we know and take for granted today. The Reformation is not a side issue in the history of the world. It is indeed the biggest single event since the establishment of the Christian Church under the Apostles and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not talking about a small aspect of history. But getting back to the core of the question, why do we, as Reformed Evangelical Christians, say that the Reformation is relevant today? In order to answer this, we must understand something of the moral and spiritual state of things prior to the Reformation. Consider, first of all, the corruption of the Church. The corruption was endemic, it was throughout, it was the popes, it was the cardinals, it was the bishops, it was the priest, the whole system was corrupt. I remember as a young uh, Roman Catholic, um, my mother saying to me that uh, it was common knowledge that that woman over at the side of the church was the common law wife of the parish priest. And yet, and I remember as a, as a young Roman Catholic thinking, well then why are people here? Where are people here? If, if, if you know, is, is it all pretense? Well, to a big degree it is. And the, the corruption had set in, in in the years leading up, in the, the centuries leading up to the Reformation, like even before the Reformation, men like Savonarola, who not necessarily was attacking the doctrine of the church, but it, it attacked the immorality of the church. He saw the corruption. Luther, of course, saw this firsthand. In his visit to Rome in 1510, he went to Rome expecting to find 
heaven on earth. He thought this would be the answer to his, his search. This would give him comfort and consolation. Instead, he saw everything that was from the pit of hell itself. In fact, Luther said that uh, if we knew where hell was, it would probably be just below Rome. So that if you were to dig a hole, you'd fall into hell. In fact, what Luther came to understand was that the outward corruption was simply the evidence of a greater problem. The root problem was the, the doctrine itself had become corrupted. This is where reformation must begin. It must begin with doctrine. It must begin with scripture. It must begin, going back to 2 Chronicles 29, it must begin with God's command, God's word, God's counsel, God's will. We have to get back to the will of God. I'm not sure of the story. I've been to the to the uh, National um, Art Gallery in, in London, and I've seen that picture with Queen Victoria and the, the tribal chief, and the, the historical question, what makes the, the British Empire so great? And the answer is that the word of God. I'm not sure if that story is actually true, uh, but the, the truth behind the story, or in the story, is true. It is the Bible. It is the Word of God. It is the fact that God speaks to us and has spoken to us in His Word. That's where we must get back to. Amen. It's not about, it's not about us being the, the best people we can be, being religious, even going to these type of meetings. It's getting back to the Word of God, getting back to the foundation. Today, our need is not to deal with the corruption in the Roman church, although that's, there is a need there, that's not particularly our calling, but to deal with the corruption in the Protestant churches. To deal with the corruption in our churches. To get back to the word of God in our churches. As we said, we've got a, a new English translation nearly every year. So even congregations are bringing out their own translation of the Bible. You see, the problem is not that we needed a new Bible. We just needed obedience to the Word of God that we have. We just need to read the Word of God that we have and obey it. So instead of an extreme of no Bible in our own language, we've got a multitude of Bibles. If the devil cannot remove, he will dilute. That's exactly what we see today. But not only the corruption in the church, but secondly, the confusion of the people. Or ignorance of the people. This is put so well with the words of Hosea. In Hosea 4 verse 6, I remember as a, a relatively young convert falling in love, the, the first book of the Old Testament I fell in love with is Hosea. Listen to what Hosea says in chapter 4 verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge I will also reject thee. You see this goes against the idea well God looks at our lives and he, he sees we're, we're doing our best and we're not that bad and we'll be okay on the day of judgment. No because you've rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. What a responsibility we have to our future generations. It's not just for our own soul. It's not for our own salvation alone. We have a responsibility. Previous generations in this nation have failed, failed not just for their own sake, but for the present generation's sake. So that in the recent abortion referendum in our own country, many of the people that voted for it were in their 70s and 80s. Bad example. Following their children rather than leading their children. This is the judgment of God. Abortion is not so much that which brings the judgment of God, it is the judgment of God. 
We see that in Scripture. The consuming of children is a judgment of God. And we have in my own country about 6,500 abortions, a small country of 5 million people. 6,500 abortions every year. Is the Protestant Reformation relevant? Absolutely it is relevant. Because of the confusion of the people. We were saying earlier on that many people today don't know, even people from the recent past, preachers from the past. You could go to Scotland today and most of the young people wouldn't know who John Knox was. They'd know what was number one in the latest pop chart, but they wouldn't know their history. They live as if there's no history. This confusion in Hosea's time led to superstition and all sorts of evil. The Roman church lived off this ignorance. It told people, you can buy your way into heaven. You can buy forgiveness. In other words, the God in heaven doesn't care about morality. He doesn't care about spirituality. He cares about your money. What a God they were presenting. But also, as we've already said, the changing of the text. We know that right back in Genesis, the question was, hath God said? The corruption of the text, the, the changing of the text, all part of the problem, all part of the reason why we must get back to what matters. What does it mean, in light of this, what does it mean to be reformed? In the face of the corruption of the church, the confusion of the people, the changing of the text, the great need today for us, though we are few, the great need is clarity of thought. Clarity of doctrine. We need to be the people who really think through these things. Not giving just the, the, the same answers and, you know, think that's enough. No, think about these things. We need in the church minds that are given to careful, <clears throat> thoughtful consideration of the issues of the day. Not just saying we've ticked the box, we've said the same things. No, let us be thinkers. In the history of the church, the greatest minds were the leaders of the Christian church. We need to pray that God would raise up men and indeed women who will be serious about the things of God so that men will lead the church and women will lead their children and will teach their children from ch as children the word of God to bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And as Martin Luther said, do not send your child anywhere where the word of God is not the supreme authority. You see, it happened in Ireland, I'm sure it's probably the same, in, in this country in the 60s, the left-wing socialists knew that if they could take over the universities and the colleges, that they would eventually get their views in the ascendancy. That's what's happened. Most of the men and women that are teaching in our universities today are atheistic, Marxist, left-wing, God-haters, and that's where the nation is sending their children. Do not Send your children where God is not the authority, where the Word of God is not the authority. Teach them the Word of God. Bring them up in God's fear. And don't sell your soul to the false idea that if you just bow to Baal and bow to Satan, well then they'll get the world. Well, maybe they will get the world, but they'll lose their soul. Not only clarity of doctrine, clarity of thought, but conviction of spirit. We live in a day when conviction, men of conviction, women of conviction, 
hard to find, and I'm talking about in the church. In the church, we need to be men and women who don't do things because we prefer them, because we like them, because this is the way we've always done it. It's amazing how powerful tradition is in Protestant churches. Well, this is what our grandfather did. This is the way it was always done. Now, let's get back to the Word of God. How does God command us? Let's be Hezekiahs. Let's be those like Nehemiah, who on the Sabbath warn them, if you come, try and come again on the Sabbath day, I'll deal with you. Men of conviction. Men who are willing to risk their own lives. And not just go with the flow and preserve their own skin. So that our, our clarity of thought and our conviction of spirit will lead thoroughly to consecration of life. Holy thoughts, holy hearts, and holy lives. This is what we need. This is what I need. This is what we need to pray for each other. To know what we believe, to know why I believe it, and then to live it out in my life, in my family, in my church, or in my society. Everywhere. Living out my convictions. So what does a reformed man or woman believe? First of all, and there's going to be no surprises here, a reformed man or woman holds to the five solas of the Reformation. It is first of all scripture alone, sola scripture. And if you read the chapter 1 of the Confession of Faith, whether it's the Westminster or the London Baptist, that first chapter, 10 paragraphs, 10 paragraphs on the necessity of Scripture, the authority of Scripture, the inspiration of Scripture, the preservation of Scripture. You see, we live in a day when evangelical churches have maybe a dozen sentences of what it means to be a Christian. We need to be more than just the, you know, bullet points. When's the last time that I've studied, that you have studied a historic Reformed Confession of Faith? We can wave the flag on reform, but are we really reformed? Have we given ourselves, as Paul says to Timothy, give thyself wholly, completely, fully to these things? Scripture alone has to be more than just a, a banner that we fly. It must be in our lives. We must feel, when, we must know, and we must be convinced that unless I have the word of God. So Knox says, give me Scotland or I die. We must say, give me the Bible, give me the word of God. As the food of my soul, or I will die. Secondly, Reform man or woman holds to sola Christus, Christ alone. Christ alone is my happiness. Christ alone is my holiness. Christ alone is my hope. Christ alone is my heaven. That I would rather spend eternity in hell with Christ than in heaven without him. Christ must be my everything. It's not about preserving society. That is a consequence of Reformation. That was a fruit of the Reformation. That wasn't the source of it. What will change this nation, why 12 men under the power of God could turn the world upside down, was their absolute commitment to Christ. Their love for Christ. Their devotion to Christ. Their willing to live and to die for Christ. That's what turned the world upside down. And that's why the world took note that these men had been with Jesus. That's what made the difference. That's what it means to be reformed. To love Christ. To love him and to worship him and to live for him. Thirdly, a reformed man or woman holds to grace alone. Sola Gracia. We understand, don't we? 
that we are here today not because of what I have done. Not because I had a better brain or, or I was just, you know, in a better mindset. That night I was converted. Mm. I wasn't seeking God. Mm. People often say to me, well, you, you were looking for something better. I said, no, I wasn't. I was very happy in my ignorance. I was very happy with my republicanism and my desire to live that life. But God had a different plan. On the road to Damascus, the Lord did not appear to Paul and say, well, I'm suggesting to you, Paul, that you change your mind. He changed him. He transformed him. Paul was confessing, or Saul of Tarsus was confessing Jesus as Lord before his mind even got into gear. Why? Because he'd been born again by the sovereign purpose and power of God. Amen. It's grace alone. Grace exclusively. And brothers and sisters, the longer we live, the more we are convinced of this. Because the longer we live, the more we realize how sinful we really are. I thought I was a sinner back in 1985. Now I really know I'm a sinner in 2021. I need the grace of God today more than ever. And God's mercy more than ever. It is, fourthly, a reformed man or woman believes in faith alone. We agree with top lady. Nothing, nothing in my hands. As Jonathan Edwards could say, the only thing that we contribute to our salvation is the sin that made it necessary. It's faith alone in Christ. And fifthly, a reformed man or woman holds to the glory of God alone. Soli Deo Gloria. Paul's doxology. I love it after those three chapters, those difficult chapters of Romans 9, 10, 11. How do you finish that? Do we finish it with a debate? Well, let's have a, a public debate between a Calvinist and Arminian. And we'll, we'll sort of say, no, Paul falls back in worship. One of the problems with New Calvinism in particular is that the doctrines of grace have become, become too much of a pride, hasn't it? These are not doctrines to make us proud. These are doctrines to humble us, to bring us down in our own estimation. Reformed believers should be the most humble Christians on the face of the earth. But often that is not the case. Our doctrine is not mixed enough with our experience to bring the right result that it should bring. Paul says in Romans 11, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, and who hath first given to him, and shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's the way to respond to these doctrines. God gets the glory. God is praised. But then, of course, as you already hinted to, a reformed man a woman confesses the doctrines of grace. We know that we're not just sick in sin. We didn't just have COVID. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We weren't just floating on the top of the water and needed somebody to throw the, the, the rubber thing to us so we could float. No, we were dead at the bottom of the ocean. We needed not just uh, restoring, we needed resurrection. Amen. We needed Christ, like at the tomb of Lazarus, to say, come forth. You that are dead and putrefied in your sin, you come forth. Reformed man or woman, knows they are chosen not because God looked into the future and saw that we were ready. 
They knew that God's knowledge was that which affects, that which changes and makes history. You see, the idea that God looks down the corridors of time separates God from time. No, time is God's part. God doesn't look as an observer. All that happens, happens by his decree. If, if that's not our God, as, as Luther said to Erasmus, Erasmus, your God is too human. It's too small. It's not the God of Scripture. See, we were born again, not, as John says, not by the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Thirdly, on this point, the Reformed man or woman agrees with the words of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, or going to the cross, I should say, in John 17, verse 9. I pray for them, and you have to understand this, in the context of the Old Testament priesthood, that the same people who were made atonement for, the priest prayed for them. Christ is on the way to the cross, and he says, I pray not for the world. 